It's exactly 16 minutes after 7. We promise we would have a conversation, all married people. This is a conversation for all of us. We've experienced this uh, at one point or the other, feeling uh, as though you were single even in marriage. Uh, but sometimes the situation could even stretch further and the whole thing could be complicated a lot more. That's why we need help. We need support. Uh, and my guests, uh, when we introduced him before, when we said this was what this was the person we we're going to talk to, we got a lot of good feedback. So uh, I know that you would love him. Uh, Amos Kevin Annan is a life coach and counselor. And uh, this is like a simple <laughs> way of introducing him. But you know that he's a big man. Good Ooh. morning and thanks for making good time. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for uh, being here. Nice meeting you for the first time. <laughs> All right. So uh, this issue seemed to be such a big deal. Yeah. Uh, people are married, but inward, they are single. How does it happen? Well, thank you for this question and the kind invitation to be here. People do not finish transiting the journey of singlehood, and they carry that into marriage. Mm. And they relish the moment of being single and wish they went back for those, but could not do away with their current marriage. Mm. So it's almost like eating your cake and still wanting to have it in your hands. Now, there are others also who were given some promises prior to marriage, and those promises have been under-delivered. And it creates a disquiet in them, and this disquiet they are unable to verbalize to their spouse. So that gives them an emotional um, disturbance as individuals. Mm. And then it creates a gap between them and their spouse. Because this is undisclosed. And as to, uh, to the extent that it's undisclosed, you are going to be the one to suffer it. Mm. Now, there are others who may have also found something untoward, which their spouse might, might be doubling in. And that creates a situation where they now want to stay off because the response they got when the issue was raised was unpleasant. Mm. And in that situation, okay, then you live your life to yourself and I live my life. So mind your business, I mind my business. But we would live as husband and wife so that the rest of the world will know that we are still living together. Mm. Now, there are also those who have friends that predated the relationship or marriage. And these friends have held sway in terms of what it is that is happening in that individual's life. Mm. So whilst they're in marriage now, they are battling for allegiance, where to tilt their allegiance. And to the extent that some spouses could even look at each other and say, well, I've had this friend all this while. They were there before you came. So there's a rivalry that is created. Mm. And all these things can create this single state of a married individual whether at the emotional level or at the physical level. When you get to a point like that, what do you do? I mean, do you get out of it because in your mind you're single anyway? Well, there's a need for you to go back to your vows, your promises that you made initially. There's a need to review the health of the marital union mm. because sometimes it's not a case that what you're thinking is the reality. So there's a need to checkmate that by verbalizing what you are, you are exp I mean, experiencing within. Mm. Now, those experiences, you need to do conversations. Not com you see, communication tends to be too formal, but conversation mm. is a kill, first kill. There's a need for you and your spouse to sit and talk in an informal, non-threatening way, not as an interrogator from the BNI. But, you know, for this to be effective, the two people must accept that there is a gap. Well, definitely, there will be noticeable gap that both of them will be aware. And that will be no denial. There's a need for you to come to a point of saying that we have an issue that we need to talk about. But it is not the case where one goes and says, Charlie, you sit down. We've got to talk. When you do that, the other person feels threatened. So what do they do? They put up a defense. I know of situations where one person says, uh, I think that this is happening, and if we don't talk about it, it could lead to something else. And the other person doesn't seem to realize that there's something happening. Yeah, I mean, when they say it could lead to something else, they need to define properly 
what it is. For instance, it's a, a husband who goes to the wife and says, can we have some intimate encounter? And the wife goes, no. And then he goes like, well, if you won't do it, I'll find somebody else. That's dangerous. If it is that kind of something else, that is dangerous. It's going to be inimical to your marital relationship. Mm. Yeah. But if it is going to be aggravated to the extent that the union is going to suffer gravely, then there's a need for both parties to sit. It may well be that only one person is feeling alone. Mm. The other doesn't feel that mm -hmm. way. And it's also dependent on our personality types and the kind of love language or dialect we speak. Because one party speaks a love language that says, as long as you provide me service, I'm OK. I don't need you to sit with me. I don't need attention. And for those individuals, giving them attention even makes them suspicious. Because they think that you have some diabolic inclines that you're going to <laughs> maneuver. Or, or you've done something you want to cover up. Cover up. You see, so they will misinterpret what you're doing. But there are others whose love language is such that they have never got into a point where they say, I'm tired of attention. Mm. So if you don't provide them the attention, they feel alone. Mm. And I've sat with couples who say, I'm loving him, I'm loving her. And she still says, I don't love her. And it's basically because you're speaking a dialect that is alien to them. Mm. So, you know, I am married, but I'm living single. Some people would justify that and say, the reality is that shadows don't allow, or shadows have led to us being at this point, to the extent that we're not even physically communicating anymore. We're talking via WhatsApp messages, uh, or usually on the phone. Sometimes talking on the phone is even nicer than talking to the person physically in person, you know, when you're around them. Is it the situations, the environment, where we are as a people today that is uh, bringing this, or it's just that we're not managing our affairs well? Well, we, we, we have to face the reality that the virtual now is real. The virtual is real. Mm. Now, for a lot of people, that's how they're thinking, especially younger folks and people who are techno-savvy they tend to think that way. Mm. Now, for those who don't tend to think techno-savvy, that's not the route to go. They're looking for something different from what we are describing. Now, you can be intimate still, virtually, but it's because the real you is not seen. Mm. And so you hide behind that and create an artifice. And that artifice you're hoping will communicate clearly, but it's manipulative. It's very manipulative. And it is also evasive of the realities. So there's a need for the couple, as long as you're a couple and you come home, shadows should not compromise your life as couples. Because definitely you meet, definitely you come home. No matter how deep in the night you work, you come and meet your spouse at home. Unfortunately, it gets to a point where the two are living in separate rooms. Mm -hmm. I've heard of a few. I, I heard of a big man whose wife was asked to stay in a separate room until he was attacked by, you know, these miscreants and then finally took a decision that let's come back together. I, I met a, a young lady who, who is hoping to be married mm. sometime soon. But she says that, listen, from, and this is a lady, I would want to have my separate room. Because there is me and there is him. There is a me time. There is me. I have to find myself in that relationship. Spouses have your me time. You will get it. But it cannot be in perpetuity. You see, your single life has influence on your marital life. Mm -hmm. So whilst you're going into that transition of marriage, you've got to weigh all the issues at stake. One of which would be, you're going to seed off some of the me and now begin to think we. Because you see, if you go into marriage with a me concept being strong and overbearing, the we cannot develop. So first, there are three phases. You leave lower relationships, less important relationships, to a greater one, which is between you and your spouse. 
Now, do when you totally you leave, leave uh, the, those other relationships? There's a other difference, do you there's leave a difference between leave and abandon. Unfortunately, in the mind of many people, when they hear leave, they're thinking of abandonment. Mm. Leave is different from abandonment. You see, you're leaving because you are trying to downsize commitments, intensity, frequency, and all those things. But, you know, it's all those things that you do that, you know, makes the friends, makes the friendship. Oh, you, st you still so have to keep you, the friendship. If, if those things are not flowing, then you really are not friends with them any longer. No, I always tell people at church sometimes, I'm not friendly, I'm not a friend of everybody, but I'm friendly towards everyone. You see, you could, you could now have to, you need to downsize on engagement with people that you call friends. Otherwise, they will destroy your marriage. They would not have set out to destroy it, but invariably, their actions and inactions will compromise the health of your marriage. Mm. Because first, you're leaving. You need to leave those lesser um, commitments and engagements with mortals around you so that you build with this significant individual. Because, see, they are significant individuals. But you see, the things that you get from these other persons, do, should you expect to get that from your significant other? Not at all. Not at all. Sometimes we become idealistic and live in an illusionary world. Why would you compare your friends, what you get, the support, the encouragement you get from your friends, from your spouse. No. That is why proud to marriage, everybody must have life. You see, for many people, they haven't lived life yet, and they are hoping to have life in the marriage. That doesn't work. It becomes but some counterproductive. But people say that, you know, the, the friends that I have, I mean, that's my life. Your friends can't be your life. You first need life. <laughs> you need to find significant you reason for existence. <laughs> you have the breath of life. <laughs> you, but you move around every day with people you talk to, you know, yeah. you, you send messages, yeah. you do things, you hang around sometimes. And if because of marriage you, you can't do these things, then the person you're married to should be able to provide some of these things. You see, the person whom you are married to is supposed to be a help meet to complement you. Mm. Now, prior to marriage, and that's one of the exercises we do in pre-marriage counseling, expectations of a spouse. What do you usually hear? Oh, I mean, you hear, I, need, I have somebody who is going to be there for me, mm -hmm. someone who will encourage me when I'm down, somebody who will be a good father or mother to our children, someone who supports the home, others to say somebody to pay the bills, I mean, those things have to come out. You see, those expectations are going to influence attitudes. Mm. Because disappointment comes when your expectations and experiences do not match. Are these good expectations, though? Oh, some are good. Others have to be modified. Because when expectations are not modified, people go with these heightened expectations. And they would always say, well, the person is under-delivering. But it's simply because of your heightened expectations. Mm. You, I mean, you want to marry somebody who looks like your dad. That's too much. You can find that. So, like, I was, if you allow me to complete this, yes, you do. leave these friendships to build with a significant individual. Then you cleave. You cleave. The cleaving part is like cementing the, the relationship. Mm -hmm. Then you work to become harmonized. Or you synchronize yourself in actions priorities, attitudes, friendships, and all that. So your friends must become my friend as well. And I have to facilitate the process of my friends becoming your friends. Otherwise, they'll become inimical to our journey. Mm. And that is what people say, you become one flesh. Mm. Predictability. I should be able to predict my spouse. She's not in a good mood. I should be able to tell whether it's verbal or non-verbal, because there will be cues that will be emanating from the spouse, and you should be able to pick those signals. Hmm. But if you become oblivious of non-verbal cues, you are always going to second-guess the person. And once a person feels misconstrued, you guess what? There's going to be conflict. It's a fertile ground for conflict. And it becomes intractable because everybody knows I am right. The most painful scenario is when danger is present 
and people do not recognize there's danger. And this is where our differences as males and females are very significant. Because men do not see danger until it is very close to them. Mm. Women see it one mile away. So if you have a woman in your life and she begins to give you a feedback of something potentially dangerous for your life, you've got to take it serious. Because you need that to complement your bravado and bravery that you have. Mm. Because men have this conquest instinct and we want to conquer. So oftentimes he will not try anything he knows is going to fail. But not so with women. So we need that kind of blend. Otherwise, we'll be exposed to too much Do you need a third party to remind you that you're living single though you're married? Or you can, it's something that you can realize yourself? Well, if you are not realizing it and your spouse brings it to your attention and you still do not budge, then your spouse may get somebody who has respectability. Somebody you can listen to, somebody whose trust you have, mm. then they can step in. As long as that third party does not have a vested interest. Mm. Because, see, oftentimes we bring third parties who have a vested interest. They either pitching camp with the lady or pitching camp with the gentleman. Mm. And that bias posture creates suspicion mm. and deepens the mistrust. Hmm. So how do you bridge? How do you become married again? First, accept that something has gone wrong. Living in denial will not help you. Secondly, you've got to solve any intrapersonal conflict or disturbance that you have. You as an individual, if there are traits and tendencies in you that are not going to be helpful to the marital union, you've got to give it attention you must accept personal culpability or liability. There's a need to do that. Then the third thing is now engage your spouse. Admitting where you have erred and where you were misunderstood, you can explain, but don't seek to justify. Okay. Avoid justification. And in this endeavor, don't look at who is wrong, look at what is wrong. Because the moment you look at who is wrong, everybody becomes defensive in their posture. Mm. But when we look at what is wrong, then we find antidote and we, we team up to win together. Now, the fourth thing is this, that always remember that your spouse is not in to hurt you. So goodwill must be exercised. If you have the mindset that my spouse wants to do me in, then you are not going to cooperate and work with your spouse. Mm. And all these things must be given time because... Time is a healer, time is a restorer, time aligns and realigns. Hmm. And it's not going to be a miracle, it's going to be a process. Especially where there's violation of trust, that trust must be earned again. You don't demand it, you must earn it again. Hmm. And if it's a sinful conduct or a behavioral pattern that is becoming detrimental to your personal health and wealth, you must commit to desist from that pattern. Yeah, if you don't do that, then your spouse will never be mm. able Gilbert, to come together. Gilbert uh, from Ablikuma says, I'm married, and this topic has transformed my marriage. Can our family background be the cause of singleness in marriage? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, if you have a persistent history of single state individuals in the marriage, mm. it, it forms a certain picture. In the family? In the family. Okay. It forms a certain picture. Oh, as for us, in our home, hey, no man can throw his weight. As for us, no woman can boss us. You know, mm. And then you take that and transit it into your marriage. So once you go into the marriage, you say, I won't allow my wife to detect to me. That posture in itself is dangerous. Mm. So it will not allow for mutuality in the, in the relationship. Mm. And I spoke earlier of the set about mutual accountability, mutual responsibility. We are accountable to each other as spouses, and we are both responsible for each other. So your body, how it turns out, is my responsibility, and my body, how it turns out, is your responsibility. If I look bad, it affects you. If you look good, it affects me too. No, but when we look good, the credit always comes to you. <laughs> when you look good, it doesn't, it hardly Are comes you sure? I mean, many men, when they get married and they meet someone, say, wow, your wife is looking after you so well. 
And so, if you're looking bad, they say, hey, you must be living with a terror. <laughs> oh, they say that? <laughs> yeah, they do. Okay. They say, you, you must be living with, uh, they call it alumbo jatao and all kinds of uh, okay. derogatory descriptions. That That's not, not a good, good one. That one is not good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what, uh, what kind of people do you keep around you? Because, you know, we're looking at the, either the wife or the husband taking the place I will use taking the place, but you would disagree with me. <laughs> taking the place of all the other people that you used to have in your life. No, even, though you, even though you have these people, but you can't do all the things you that you used to do with them. You definitely feel, I mean, Mamavi, you always feel that the significant individual in your life is taking the place of certain individuals. Hmm. That is normal feeling to have. But don't we have to grow out of that? We cannot stay toddlers in that area. Hmm. We must accept that this is a new lease of life. And for those who are religious, I always say a new level introduces a new devil. And you should be able to count those in issues that needs to be identify yeah. them and be willing to let go. Yeah. And, and it's a sign of maturity also. Maturity is that you know when to go for what and when to defer action. Mm. Now, who do you keep around you? I would suggest that people who reinforce your values Okay. It's very important. If you're hanging around people who say, well, Charlie, you are married, don't say because you are married now you're going to stick to one woman. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. Don't go around those ladies who say, well, I mean, if you're a woman, I mean, if you go and have a fling with some man somewhere and just enjoy, he doesn't take away everything, he lives it with you. I mean, if you have such types of women around you, they actually water down your value systems. Secondly, people whose judgment you can trust. To be honest, you see, our friends have such a great influence on us. And once you are my friend, I influence you. So you've got to be careful who comes into your life and the judgment they give you. Sure. Thirdly, one whose testimony, private and public, is incontrovertible. Some people have a terrible testimony out there. And when you align and associate with them, it compromises your own. Mm. They soil you fatally. Fourthly, a person who will respect your significant individual in okay. your life. Okay. Because see, if I'm your friend and I don't respect your wife, if I come, I become a rival to your spouse. Because I will undermine the health of that marriage to my advantage. Mm. So they become self-seeking individuals. Sure. And those we don't need to keep around us. Okay. Uh, in wrapping up this conversation, which I don't want to end, by the way, <laughs> uh, Arnold from Ashiye said, to avoid these issues, should we encourage cohabitation? Probably uh, that while together, we'll help each other to see and correct. Uh, is it perfectibles? Well, Arnold, please, cohabitation has a way of undermining the marital union. Mm. I've sat with people who have cohabitated for two years. They later marry, and it's almost like they become people who have lived together for 10 years. In economics, there's the law of diminishing returns, <laughs> and it sets in terribly. Yeah. So you don't want to do that, because marriage rests on trust and fidelity. If you lose that proud to marriage, you've got to do a lot of work. To get it back. To get it back. Okay. Uh, this one says, I'm really enjoying the program. Please, what happens when you're married and one side is not compromising uh, when it comes to putting the house in order? That is when one is putting up a project and one side is adamant and contributing while you are all workers. Uh, this not necessarily. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Mamami, I'm happy you're back on AM show. The resource person is good. Uh, in his field. I'm married for the past 11 years, but I've learned a lot of things from him for the first time. That's from Akwesi Abuaji Edu Chum Thank in you, Kibi watching the show. Uh, this one says, can sex break the gap of singleness in marriage? Gilbert from Ablikuma, who is definitely following mm -hmm. through, is asking, uh, where can I download this clip? Uh, we're going through a crisis in our marriage, but I believe we are both in denial. Sadly, I'm watching this alone because my wife is thousands of miles away uh, that's from Kojo in Tema. Uh, this one is, 
Uh, Mamavi, you were very quick in your comments on cover-ups. Did you ever work with the KGB? I don't know what you're asking. Okay, but yes, uh, uh, we're streaming live on the internet now, uh, but our clips are also downloaded. So just go to myjoyonline.com. There's a link to YouTube, and you can see every episode or segment that you miss later on. Okay, uh, you have to box all these well, things that we're asking together and wrap Well, up. I mean, if you allow sex to become the bonding factor in your marriage, then you don't have a marriage. You have a sex partner. Okay. So the gentleman whose wife is at a distance, um, living at par with your spouse is something that you need to talk and talk and talk. If there's a way for both of you to come together, it's healthier. Mm. It's preferred over living separately. Mm. Uh, that creates a lot of uh, vulnerability in the spouses and uh, predisposes you to adventure. And if you also get vulnerable towards adventurous individuals, then a bad case. Yeah. Now, at all costs, we must all endeavor to appreciate that first we are individuals who have come together to live as spouses. Mm. Now, that journey is not going to be easy. There will be tensions, there will be temptations, there will be tempests, and all those things, you have to find a way of triumphing over them. Okay. And you do so mutually. All right. Uh, so I'll have you again, right? I look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed every bit of it. Thank you. I'm happy you could make it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, too, for having me. All right. Uh, that's... Uh, I can't say Amos. I have to say Reverend Amos no, Kevin Amos. Hannan, <laughs> Amos who is a life Kevin. coach and also a counselor. Uh, later on this morning, you're on Adum FM 106.3. Yes, I am. I am. Yeah, what are you talking about? Uh, I've been talking about how men can uh, take good care of their wives. I've dealt with that of women. The men, yeah. And I listen I'm to on them. Bits of that. <laughs> I'm speaking to the men and how they can handle the significant yeah. women in their lives. Okay, cool. I yeah. like that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so stay with us when we come back. Today is Autism Awareness Day. Uh, and I remember this. I took it because uh, there are some cute children, autistic children, who made uh, this for me. Uh, but we're listening to a couple uh, whose three-year-old boy has just been diagnosed with autism. Uh, we want to know how they are taking it uh, so that if you find yourself in that same situation, you can learn from from their experience. Stay with us, you're watching the AM show. You can always pass on a comment to us via WhatsApp 0560 800,000 and on Facebook, join news on TV. And please, I didn't go anywhere. I'm still on the AM show. A lot of people are very angry with me because I said that I had left. Stay with us, we'll come back with a lot more.